In the last episode, we sketched an antique restoration shop, then inked it. Now it's time for colors and renders. Well, hello there, I'm Detroit. If you've missed the first part of this digital drawing tutorial, I highly encourage you to pause this video and go watch it. I'll make it simple for you, here's a link in the top corner. All good? Let's get to coloring this pretty line art that we ended up with. After that, we'll shade it, then render it. I'm gonna explain everything I took into account making this picture, all the tips I can think of and how every choice I make is controlled and conscious to give the best result. First step, choosing colors and making flats. When I planned this drawing in the sketching phase, I decided that I wanted a cozy atmosphere, so something with warm tones. I won't repeat all of what I said in the previous video, but this is going to be mostly wood tones, browns, oranges and reds. To contrast with that, a bit of green and metallic greys. Finally, a tiny bit of blue that will make it more interesting. I would say the ratio is about 60% warm tones, 30% cold tones and 10% highlight colors, so the blues. You can see the palette I start with in the corner over there. Making flats is a pretty easy process, although for a line art as big and detailed as this one, it's a long one. Basically, what you do is create layers under the ink layers and draw with the desired color on them. You can also use the magic wand to auto-select an area and then fill it with the bucket tool. Since my line art is split into a lot of layers, I turned on the all layer sampling of the magic wand so I can select any part of the drawing as long as it shows on screen. Because the selection borders only looks at the pixels, it's a bit janky sometimes. At the edge of every black ink line, the pixels get more transparent and the selection stops. For that, I use the Expand Selection option, which I have mapped to the short key F1. I use 3 pixels expansion to ensure the selection goes within the inking line and then I can fill the area. During the flatting, I add and tweak the color palette constantly. I didn't make it fully coherent before using it and so I have to adjust a bit based on how it looks. I'm also adding darker tones, which I had overlooked at first. If you color a picture using only the same kind of values, it will look bland and straight up bad. Our eyes need diversity, they get easily bored otherwise. They want dark wood and light wood. In the context of this scene I'm drawing, it also makes sense. The table and the wooden clocks wouldn't be made from the same material. Same with the handles and the tools. They are all wood but different colors. The table and handles would be made from a harder and stronger wood probably and the clocks from a prettier one. Some would be varnished and others wouldn't. All in all, that gives us different tones, be it in hue, saturation or value. And now let me give you a quick tip on balancing the colors. I already talked about the ratio, which I estimate to be 60 to 30 to 10% for each type of color. If you have every family of tone exactly a third of the picture, the impact is a bit lost, so it's important to have some colors being used less. Another rule I like to follow that makes the coloring simpler is that you can't use a color only once. The color has to appear a few times. Let's look at the green shirt, for example. By itself, the combo green shirt blue pants takes enough space and is different enough from the surroundings to catch your eyes. It's nice because the character is the focus of the scene, but I don't want it overpowering the rest. I want it to blend a bit more. This is why the panel on the wall is green too, although maybe a slightly different green. You know what, let's pause the video and look at the finished flats. The way the picture works, we have the blue and green of the character in the middle. Top left, there is a big green area, but desaturated as to not contrast too much with the rest. Top right, lots of bright blues, but in tiny proportions. This way, the color pattern on the character makes more sense rather than feel alien in this workshop. Alright, back to the video, let's keep doing this. I particularly like the metallic tones in this picture. They're like the bridge between the warm wood and the colder tones. The shelves are a very simple grey, but the random parts all over the place are mostly two sorts of colors. The saturated green-grey, like the body of the soldering iron, or a dirty golden orangey yellow, like the pendulum or the things in the open drawer. I based it on the color of brass. This color works especially well on the green background or in places that are mostly desaturated because it pops a little bit but not too much. Everything is about balance in this picture, if you haven't understood it yet. Now about the workflow of this step of the picture before we move on to shading. There's a lot of details here. Even with a reduced color palette and using a lot of the same tones, I'm still juggling with a dozen or so colors here. If you color it in a random order, it's hell. So I decided to start with the largest colors, the one that will give the atmosphere more substance from the beginning. 
The background is in grey, then on the layer above the desk is brown, then on the layer above the green panel, then the red carpet, etc. It sounds obvious, but don't forget to always go from the back towards the front with your layers. You'll be more precise with the details. White is also very distracting, so it's easier to have everything in grey until I color it. My layers are thus pretty organized until a certain point. For all the small objects, I don't organize by color anymore, but by area or groups. The flask took forever, and I had a lot to say about it. Finally, let's move on in the process and get to shading. Gradients and clipping masks. That's the brunt of it, let me explain. Here, everything is flat. We need to make it more real, and the best way to do that is to play with the light of the scene. I have decided that all the colors I've laid down are the intrinsic color of every object, seen as if they were lit by a perfect white light individually, so without interacting shadows. It is the light mode, if you will, and the dark mode would be if you laid all the colors as if they were in shadows. By the way, if some objects you've colored look like their color is the dark version, now is the time to rectify it. It's so much easier in your workflow to have either everything light and dark in it, or everything dark and light in it. In reality, this workbench is probably lit by a circular overhead light, a bit on the right of the sleeping guy. Now I need to include this central spotlight onto the scene. Gradients are a wonderful tool for that. Using a clipping mask on each layer of flats, I can control the area affected by the gradient. The larger objects, like the desk or the ground, I'll use a circular gradient to give an idea of the shape of the light. For the smaller ones, a linear gradient is fine and easier to control. I will do that with every layer, not necessarily in order, but still mostly from big to small. Sometimes I change the order because I need to have a feel for how a certain thing is going to be lit to figure out the shadows underneath it. A simple gradient is a good base from which to continue. A good example is the desk. I've added the gradient on one layer, then using the darker tone of the gradient, I'll carefully go over every sub area. The top of the legs of the desk will be in the shadow cast by the flat part and so on. Then I will move to a new clipping mask layer and focus on the shadows cast by the other objects above it, as is the case for everything on the desk, projecting a shadow onto the desk. I know it sounds very obvious, but it's the best workflow I've found, staying organized for the best result, and more importantly, to not forget a part of the drawing. There is one thing you need to be careful about during this shading part. Obviously, I started very light, and now I need to make sure I'm not going too dark. Zooming out of the piece helps take the whole thing in and adjust if needed. To adjust, since every type of shading is on its own layer, I can half alloc the layer and change the color, for example or change the opacity and so on. The best way to check if you're going too dark or not is to have a look at the values. Values are the lightness or darkness of a color, and in Photoshop you can make a saturation layer on top of everything else and put the saturation to zero. This will convert everything to grayscale to check the values, and you can flick it on and off whenever you want to see it. So far, I've talked about the simple gradients, mainly going from the lighter flat color to a darker version. Sometimes it can be useful to have another gradient on top of your overall shading and go from one dark tone to another dark tone. If you look at the character's shading, you can see it. His arms shadows are more desaturated, more grey, and the leg shadows are more red. It's a simple and neat way to make it more interesting and bring the focus towards the center. And that is my shading. This sort of art style is very simple in a way, and so the process is efficient enough. If I were to work with textured elements, now would be when I would add the wood grains or scratches on the metal, etc. But here, I'll keep it simple. In the previous video, I talked about my inspiration for this style, which is Carl's Dalmo, and here is where I'll change things and do it my way. I am a bit bored with this black line art. I don't want a coloring book page, and the lines are a bit too thick to forget that they are there. Grouping all the inking layers together, I'm adding clipping masks on top, this way I can color the line art only. Now begins the long process of picking all the colors, making them darker and going over every line. For more reflective objects like metal, I'll add more contrast between the values of the object and its outline. For wood, the line color will be closer to that of the object. It's very subtle and I'm not sure it perfectly shows, but that's how I like to approach coloring line art. While I'm doing this never-ending step of the drawing process, there's one thing I forgot to mention. Normally, when coloring something, I would add a step after the shading, and that's highlight. 
Just like the coloring was 60% one tone, 30% another and 10% the contrast color, I like to go at it with 60% flats, 30% shadow and only 10% highlights. In this style, it's so simplistic that highlights would overwork it and make it more confusing with the line art. Just for the sake of focus, I do add a bit of lighter tone on the skin of the character, but that's it. With the amount of objects in this scene, would you imagine adding reflections on every piece of metal? I don't want to do that, and it's useless. It's not realistic, but the style isn't, so I'm free to forget highlights. Besides, the way I will render the picture as a whole in a second, most of the highlights would be invisible after it. I sped up the coloring over all the lines in this video compared to the rest because there's not much more to say about it. The same principle as with shading apply here too, and that's it. The final touches of the picture. That's what I call render for the lack of a better word, but technically render is so much larger than that. I guess you could call that step effects. I want a cozy atmosphere. I'll never say it enough. Here the picture is still a bit all over the place and the values are mostly flat. I want to add a uniform shading to everything in order to leave only the focus. My workflow for this step is a bit messy, I haven't really figured it out. As soon as you start messing around with layer styles, my best advice would be to try out everything until you're satisfied. I'm starting with a circular, transparent to dark gradient with grey. As a multiply layer over the whole picture, I lower its opacity until it looks fine in terms of overall values. Now the edges are much darker but not hidden. It's almost like a glow around the middle of the picture. On another layer on top, I have the same gradient but colored this time. It's a strong red and you can see all the layer styles flicker until I pick one and change its opacity to match my vibe. I ended with it as an incrustation layer and 30% opacity. The red gives a bit of warmth to the edges because shadows make it look colder than I want it to be. Finally, as is the case with every single artwork ever, comes the time of fixing mistakes. Usually this part comes a day after or at least several hours after the rest, just so you can get a new perspective on what you're working on. Here it's mainly the wall and floor under the desk that needs to be darker and the foot I want to fix. I would have left the foot as it was even if it looked bad, but it's at the very center of the canvas and I don't want people to fix it too much. In the same way, the white of the shoes was too bright and I darkened it a bit. Really, the focus is on the feet, stop looking at it. With it blended with the back a bit more, I'm much happier with my piece. I hope you're happy too. I think it's one of my favorite drawings of the year, this one. I went in with a certain objective of art style and vibe and I really did what I set out to do. I hope you learned a few things along the way, a few tips maybe, or simply hearing again what you know but stop thinking about a while back. Keep it simple, don't overwork it, be patient, study your references and you'll be happier with your art. I would really love it if you let me know what you think and if you took the time to check out my other videos, maybe even subscribe. Leave me a comment with a prompt you would like to see me draw and come say hi on Twitter, TikTok and Instagram. I'm Detroit, don't fall asleep near a soldering iron. Bye!